throughout the week, we brought you our series on food production in Africa. Now, Lindy Mtangana brings us the last installment on exports. Let's take a look. Thank you for joining us for the final installment of our special series, Food Production in Africa. Today, we take a look at some of the giants of African export. Despite its proximity to the birthplace of coffee, Ethiopia coffee growing was introduced in Kenya relatively late, around 1900. Despite the late start, today it is a country renowned for having some of the best coffee in the world. Nonetheless, Kenya's coffee sector faces challenges for the future and low global prices, combined with climate change and population growth, have diminished the country's output over the last decade. Now, with the coronavirus effects being felt in every sector, the industry is taking yet another hit. Here's Alexandria Majala with more. Every day, an estimated 2.25 billion cups of coffee are consumed worldwide. 90% of what's in these cups is produced in developing countries. Coffee was introduced into Kenya about the same time the colonial masters began their journeys into Africa. It has remained a major contributor to the country's economy for over a century. Almost 80% of them live on their farm. I paid Fairview Estate a visit 10 kilometers from Kenya's capital, Nairobi, to talk to them about coffee production. Fairview Coffee Estate was established in 1909 by a European lady called Evelyn Poy. So the coffee you're seeing here was actually planted in 1909. Kenya's industry benefits from two harvests a year, the fly crop and the main crop. The crop is harvested when the berries turn wine red. Normally during the picking season we pick from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. So the coffee pickers bring their coffee to a sorting area. So we hand sort the coffee before processing. Then after we have hand sorted the picked coffee, we put it through a, ch a sherry hopper, like basically a concrete, a concrete funnel where you put all the coffee berries and then they get into a machine that helps us remove the skin. So we remove the skin and then we put the coffee seeds in fermentation tanks. So we ferment the coffee overnight to remove that slimy membrane on top of the coffee berry so that in the morning it's easy to wash. So that's why most of Kenyan coffee is called washed Arabica because it goes through this washed process. Afterwards, the coffee goes through a water grading process and later it's dried, milled and graded by bean size. Lastly, they are roasted and grinded. 93% of the Arabica coffee grown here is headed for the export market, while 7% is consumed locally. In May 2020, Kenya exported $21.5 million worth of coffee, down from $23.9 million the previous month. A myriad of challenges has seen the sector's performance fluctuate over the last decade. Ideally, we should be receiving around 1,200 millimeters of rainfall, but because of climate change and all that we hardly get that so we are forced to irrigate our coffee. To contend with changing weather patterns and the fall in production that comes with it, the Kenyan government introduced a new variety into the market called the Roiro 11. The Arabica bean has been met with some resistance in some quarters, while others like Fairview Estate have embraced the new bean. The main determinants of a good quality coffee, I would say, is mainly your practices and the altitudes that you can't do anything about and the rainfall, but mainly the practices. So Ruru 11 is still an uh, Arabica type of coffee. So depending on how you grow it and how a sustainable farmer you are, you're still expected to get a very good cup from the, from the Ruru 11. Coffee is currently Kenya's fourth largest export commodity and provides 6% of the total agricultural exports. But coffee farmers on average earn 35% of the international market value of their beans. So to help growers maximize their profits, the government allows farmers to sell their coffee directly to international buyers. About 15 years ago, we decided to uh, go up the value chain a little bit more uh, so we could begin to do direct sales. And so we went into the certification process. We are certified by four uh, global certification partners, including people like Rainforest Alliance, Starbucks, Oots, um, and so, you know, through, through that process, we're able then to, to sell our coffee direct uh, to buyers like, you know, Louis Berger, like Starbucks. Um, and when you sell your coffee direct, you're able to, to double, literally, the value that you're getting uh, from, from the auctions. 
to smell the aroma. According to the Coffee Board of Kenya, Kenyan beans have a bright acidity, potent sweetness, and a dry, whiny aftertaste. However, these flavors haven't appealed much to local consumers. Nonetheless, stakeholders believe that there's room for market share to grow. There's the vibrant um, urban youth that with outlets like Java and, and others emerging are increasingly drinking you know, more coffee. I think it's, it's, um, it's seen as a sexy beverage, uh, not only here, but in, in other parts of the world. Um, it's got great health benefits um, if you don't drink too much. Um, and so, yeah, we, 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 we are trying to promote coffee drinking uh, because at the end of the day, if people do uh, drink more coffee beverages, that income, you know, hopefully will, will filter down uh, to the people that we employ here. You pull it to your front teeth to the back of your mouth. Despite facing many challenges over the last three decades, Kenya's coffee sector continues to make it a leading cash crop for the country. Alexandria Majala for CGTN, Kiambu, Kenya. South Africa has a thriving fresh fruit market, which accounts for more than half of all agricultural exports from the country. Hoekstra Fruit Exporters, which was founded by Art Hoekstra in Paal in 1950, is one of the leading grower export companies. Now 90 years old, the farmer brought his expertise from the Netherlands and helped cultivate the table grapes industry in South Africa by supplying new varieties to growers. The company now produces 1.2 million cartons of table grapes a year and employs close to 2,000 permanent and seasonal workers. CGTN's Julie Shire visited Hoekstra on his Nancy farm in Paal, where the story all began. This one will be ripe. Christmas time. Some people are absolutely happy to be managing a farm when they get good salary, when they get part of the profits. I myself, uh, with the little flower business which I started here, which developed to table grapes and which developed to melons and, uh, and the growing of it all, that was my pleasure. My name is Art Hoekstra. I am the founder of the Hoekstra Fruit Farms. Between 1950 and 2020, today, at 70 years, the best 70 years I could wish for. We have a few cultivars which were not developed by myself, but with our working together. One of them, the Muscat Delight. Muscat Delight is a very good eating quality grape and unfortunately it's seeded and the market now looking for seedless grapes all the time. But this seeded variety has such a beautiful taste that it is selling at, at premium prices all the time. Only very little one can do by yourself. We would not be able to farm today without all the ladies, especially ladies, farm workers who work on a 12 month of the year basis on the farms, who live on the farms, uh, they are part of the farms. But in Paul itself, in the season time, we have more than a thousand young ladies helping to work in the vineyards, to harvest the fruit, to pack it in boxes, to do everything needed. Farming has its ups and its downs. You have sometimes bad weather conditions, you have sometimes some problems, but you have to make the best of a situation like that. It was not bad in our area as it was in some other areas. Some other areas really were very hard hit. We ourselves were uh, okay. We could go through without having real poor crops. We still had a good, good harvest all the time. We have 12, 13, 14 managers, each managing their own farm. Our grapes mainly export to Holland, Germany and Spain, but also to Belgium, France, 
uh, the Far East a little, China, and a uh, little goes to Dubai, the, the Middle East. I think to retire is not a good thing. Once you go and sit on the stoop, you get old, and that's not, that's not a good thing. Keep on going as long as you can and enjoy what you do and uh, make the best of it. And you will, you will be happy. I think that is, that is the secret of life. Tunisia produced 300,000 tons of olive oil during the 2019 harvest. In spite of the turmoil caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, the North African country's olive oil exports have experienced substantial growth in 2020. More and more private sector employees, as well as residents of the cities, are moving to the inner regions to work in the olive oil sector, which guarantees food for millions of Tunisians, while providing important foreign exchange reserves and creating job opportunities in the agricultural sector in remote villages. Mukhtar bin Yahya is a video editor who has worked for dozens of Tunisian and international TV channels in the capital city Tunis before changing the course of his career this year and choosing agriculture. He has recently returned to his native town of Birali bin Khalifa in the governorate of Sfax, where his 87-year-old father has donated 10 hectares of olive trees to Mukhtar and his younger brother. All my ancestors were farmers and owners of olive trees. I hesitated for a while before choosing agriculture over a professional career in the media and television industry. My roots are tied up to these trees. Farming is the best solution to earn a decent living. The land is always grateful. Mukhtar is proud of taking care of his olive trees. The 39-year-old landowner has invested all his savings for drilling a well and making water available in this remote area where rain is rare. He wants to increase this farm's productivity and reach self-sufficiency in olive oil while boosting his annual revenue by up to 40%. I'll dedicate my life to the olive tree. One can live comfortably if he produces his own food. Olive oil is the basic ingredient for any Tunisian dish. I also want to export this golden liquid to the international market. Just like thousands of local producers, Mokhtar dreams of exporting his olive oil to the international market. The Tunisian company Olivco has specialized in selling packaged extra virgin olive oil in Europe, the Arab region, North America and Asia, but especially China. Zhang is a Chinese businessman who lives in Tunisia. He has traveled to the best olive farms in the Mediterranean basin before choosing to work with Olivco. This Tunisian company has won the world's most prestigious awards at several international olive oil competitions like the best of show. The first thing that comes to mind when I buy Tunisian olive oil from Olivco is quality. Tunisian olive oil is the best in the Mediterranean. It's even better than Greece, Spain and Italy. We are responsible towards our clients in China. Olivco's clients usually export tons of this organic product after smelling and tasting the best olive oil in the world. We have been doing this for more than 3,000 years. So we have the experience and the knowledge and we have the soil for it and the climate. So it is a perfect scenario for an olive tree. Olivco and other companies have exported 146,000 tons of olive oil in the first quarter of 2020, which generated revenue of around $310 million. So we have about 163 varieties here in Tunisia, and I try to, uh, to bring them back to life and, 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 and try to get the consumer to taste a different, uh, a different variety, different taste. Tunisian authorities requested from the European Union to increase its duty-free olive oil import quota from the North African state to 100,000 tons. Currently, EU importers can bring up to 56,700 tons into the 27-member trading bloc without paying tariffs. The current import quota is not enough because production is going up and consumers want more. It is time to update the 20-year-old agreement with the EU. Experts say the taste varies from the north to the south of the country, but the golden liquid remains a gift from nature and a healthy option 
for any consumer in the world. Adnan Shawashi, CGTN, Tunis, Tunisia. South Africa's fishing industry is worth close to $300 million annually and directly employs about 27,000 people in the commercial sector. Now, the country's sector was largely let off the hook during the country's COVID-19 lockdown, and that's because government had classified commercial fishing as essential. But restrictions on exports and the months-long closure of the country's hospitality industry took a toll on both large and small-scale fishing. Renéa Delcam has more. South Africa has a coastline of almost 3,000 kilometers with a rich fishing tradition. I traveled along the Western Cape's Atlantic seaboard to meet with seasoned fisher folk in this region. Fishing was my everything. It, um, it, it, that was my livelihood that brought my child to school and it, made me, it gave me a living. I'm born and bred a fisherman and uh, I'll die a fisherman. South African fishers have been allowed to fish throughout the COVID-19 lockdown. But in the past few months, decent catches along the southwestern coast of South Africa have been few and far between. Small-scale commercial fishers like Malcolm de Vries, who's been at sea for over half a century, say fishing here is not what it used to be. There is no more fish. There is no more fish because it's getting wiped out. Same as up here, the moon and the crayfish, and it's all getting wiped out. Fishers here believe the snook and other fish species are being depleted by major factors such as overfishing by big trawlers and changes in the weather patterns because of climate change. We used to catch snook for pretty much 10 months of the year um, throughout Cape Town and surrounding areas. Um, now we basically catch it between April, March, April, May um, up the west coast and pretty much no snook down the east, down where we are now. So now we're having to catch yellowtail, hottentots, anything else that's just to be able to keep our industry alive. The small scale fishers say they are grateful that the South African government allowed them to work throughout the COVID-19 lockdown but say the negative impact of the lockdown has been severe. COVID has hit us pretty hard. Um, I looked at my catch returns. I used to catch uh, 13 to 15 days a month. I'm now down to seven to eight days a month. I'm hoping that the tourism and the restaurant industries do open up because um, that is a big part of our markets. Now there's a digital marketplace which aims to give small scale fishers in South Africa, Seychelles and other parts of the world greater access to markets. It's a digital app called Avalobi. It wants to put the power and pride back into the hands of the fishers. Abalobi means fisher in Koza, a local language here in South Africa. And our organization is a tech startup geared towards empowering small-scale fishers. So, so really where the technology comes in is, is twofold. On the one hand, to empower fishers to collect that information and that data. And then the other part of it is, is to access market. So where a small-scale fisher is able to get a much better price for his catch. These small-scale fisher folks say they are hoping for a good fishing season during the coming summer months and praying that they will be able to ride out whatever a possible second wave of the COVID-19 pandemic brings to these shores. Renad al Kam, CGTN, Cape Town, South Africa. For the last five days, we brought you experts from Africa, Israel, and the United States who enlightened us on issues of irrigation, post-harvest loss, and innovation. I'm now heading to speak with our last expert from China, Professor Li Xiendoa, on how countries can come together to share key agricultural information to bolster food security in Africa.
Well, thank you for joining us, Professor. Uh, Professor, the Chinese Communist Party Central Committee and the State Council implemented a new policy directed into the support of the country's agricultural sector and uh, farmers. Now, what are some of these support systems that we are laid and are still offered to Chinese farmers? You can see that all those policies are favorable for rural development. And with this strategy, we have also heavy investment into the local infrastructure. For example, the irrigation uh, rate is uh, more than 50% in the whole China. And also building the partnership uh, between the different areas, between the urban and rural. And uh, uh, what has been the uh, impact of these efforts in food production in the country so far? Production increasing substantially, uh, especially since 2004, we, we experienced uh, 12 years consecutive bumper harvest. Uh, in recent years, the annual growth rate of farms income are about 6%. Now, Professor, with the manufacturing industry in China expanding and attracting more people into the urban areas, how is China coping and addressing this challenge of people leaving the rural areas where much of the food production takes place? So farm household in China is a, a tiny farm, very small. It's just 0 0.5 hectares. So a lot of people uh, you know, leave their hometown, uh, seek a job in the city and uh, employed in no agriculture sectors. In recent years, government encouraged the development of, of the utilization of machineries. So the machineries replace the labor. So now the production uh, become more and more technology and the capital intensive. And uh, what lessons can Africa get from China's reforms and policies that secured the country's food security? Rural infrastructure are very important, extremely for road, electricity, water, irrigation, and drainage. So in these cases, the government should spend a lot of money uh, in agricultural and rural sectors. And secondly, it's uh, the, uh, the utilization of uh, applicable technology and certainly it's a uh, capacity building you know with uh, the development of uh, the, the, the rural areas they need some special skill so in this case the government should provide it the according the skills uh, for sm small farm holders how is china addressing the issue of climate change in relation to food production uh government encourage farm to uh adopt the sustainable farming practices and to try to improve the uh, water utilization efficiency. So government spend a lot of money to select uh, the high yield and high resistant uh, to varieties of agricultural crops. We've brought you a range of insights into food production in Africa, but now it's time to hear from you. Our digital team collected your comments and feedback. Here's Daniel Plafka with Africa Response. Over the past five days, we've heard from Africa's food producers, smallholder farmers in nine countries, and from leading experts on the challenges and opportunities facing Africa when it comes to food production. But we also wanted to hear from our audiences. CGTN Africa's digital team conducted a week-long survey of opinions and attitudes on everything agriculture, from irrigation, farming practices and technologies, to infrastructure and more. So let's dive right into those results. When it comes to whether farmers are getting the support they need, the news from the ground is not very promising. Nearly 75% of our viewers say farmers in their country don't have access to sufficient training or education to improve their craft. Meanwhile, two-thirds of respondents say infrastructure development decisions are often made without taking food production into account. Afriye Odankwa from Ghana says the food-growing regions in his country lack sufficient roadworks, which can present major challenges when it comes to bringing crops to market. When it comes to young people's participation in agriculture, a generational shift 
seems to be at play. A whopping 75% of survey respondents told us they're seeing more and more young people turn back to the land. It's a trend that's being fueled by high rates of youth unemployment throughout the continent, and one that's being bolstered by the quickening pace of technological innovation in the agricultural sphere. John Abimiku in Nigeria says most African youth are discouraged from farming because of its association with hard labor. He says African leaders must invest in mechanized farming if the continent is to attain food sufficiency. With more and more of the arable land in the African countries shifting from food crops to cash crops aimed at the export market, nearly 40% of respondents said their governments weren't doing enough to support domestic producers of food. Kevin Marcus in Kenya says African governments ought to create favorable conditions for local farmers to compete in international markets, including subsidies on inputs like fertilizers and seedlings. And while some were concerned that food should not be sent abroad while domestic shortages still exist at home, others disagreed. Here's John in Nigeria again. The problem with food shortages in Africa, he writes, is not because of food exports to other continents, but due to climate change and old farming methods. Agriculture is Africa's major source of foreign exchange, and cutting our exports in agriculture can only plunge us into more hunger and abject poverty. The questions facing the continent's food challenges are numerous as they are important. And, as we found through our survey, they're often contentious as well. But what's certain is that the future of Africa's food system won't just be decided on farms or in parliaments, but in the minds and social media feeds of the continent's youth. And on that note, we wrap up our series on food production in Africa. We hope you've been enlightened on how Africa produces food and how the continent can boost its food security and expand exports. Thanks for watching and goodbye.